Now we've mentioned the attraction between the electrons of one atom and the protons in another atom. The attraction that an atom has for another atom's electrons in a chemical bond is called electronegativity. If you need, go back to Unit 3 and review this. But that measure is essentially a ranking system. Now, in this table here, you'll see that we've got uh, just the S and P elements represented. We're not going to worry too much about the transition metals, although we could look up their values. But this gives us a pretty good idea of what the trends are with how the electronegativities change on the periodic table. You'll notice that in the lower left of the table, we have these low values because the atoms are large, they're not attracting the electrons very well, and they're also atoms that would rather give up electrons and form positive ions. On the upper right, this is where we have our highest values. <clears throat> Those fluorine and oxygen have the highest values on the periodic table. This is because they are small. Because they're small, electrons from other atoms can get close to them and the attraction be very strong. Notice that we don't have any values here for helium, neon, and argon. The reason for this is because electronegativity is measured based on how the atoms act in compounds. That means that an atom would actually have to form a chemical bond before it could go into the ranking system. Helium, neon, and argon have never had any compounds formed from them, so we can't really measure what their electronegativity values are. Krypton and xenon have had some compounds formed, so we can include them in our ranking system. We're not going to usually look at those, though, because the compounds with xenon and krypton are very rare and unstable. We can use electronegativity differences to help us identify what kind of a chemical bond we have. What we would look at is the difference between the two atoms that are bonded together and what their electronegativity difference is going to be. If the difference in electronegativity is zero, or the electronegativities are equal, we are going to essentially have a nonpolar covalent bond. We'll talk more about what's required for this later. <clears throat> but if the electronegativity difference is extremely low, or extremely small, we can essentially say that they're nonpolar. As electronegativity differences increase, the sharing between electrons becomes unequal. This is because the electronegativity, being a measure of how well they attract electrons, means that if there is a difference in electronegativity, one atom is going to be attracting the electrons more strongly than the other. That means that if there is sharing occurring, the atom that has the higher electronegativity is going to be attracting the electrons more strongly, and they will spend more time around that atom. If the electronegativity difference gets great enough, sharing becomes so unequal that we essentially have a transfer of electrons from one atom to another, and this is what we would call an ionic bond. Notice on this little table or diagram that I have, we've got electronegativity differences represented, and we have some examples of compounds, but nowhere on this do we have a definitive division between polar covalent covalent and ionic compounds. That's because electronegativity is just one factor that we are going to take into consideration when looking at what type of bond we have. Yes, it's pretty safe to say that over here cesium fluoride is going to be ionic because of the very large difference in electronegativity. It also is going to be hinted at by the fact that cesium is a metal and fluorine is a nonmetal. And we've learned that ionic compounds occur between metals and nonmetals. We've also seen down here that if we have an extremely low electronegativity difference, we're pretty sure it's going to be a covalent bond. And what we're doing is just trying to distinguish how whether that bond is going to be polar or not, meaning is there going to be any inequality to the attraction between the atoms for the electrons. It's this area here where we get into a gray area. There are compounds that have higher electronegativity differences yet are covalent, and there are some compounds that would have lower electronegativity differences that are ionic. What we have to do is look at other factors. Primarily, if you have a nonmetal reacting with a nonmetal, it's going to form a covalent compound. If you have a metal reacting with a nonmetal, 
it's pretty good chance that you are going to have an ionic bond. There is no distinction between where ionic bonding and electronegativity differences start and where they end. There's no division between where polar and nonpolar covalent bonds begin and end. It's more of a spectrum. We know what orange looks like and we know what yellow looks like, but where does yellow stop and where does orange begin? Since there's no set division, there's a little bit of a gray area in the sense that we, we have to look at other factors besides just electronegativity.